Good evening, everyone, and it's really great, Mary, that you're here for this um, conversation this evening on our theme, Agents of uh, Social Transformation in Ireland. Um, I'm not going to give a big introduction for Mary. You all know about her. She was president of Ireland for 14 years, which says it all, actually, I think, and travelled wildly globally throughout that time and got to know... I think a large amount, a large numbers of the Irish diaspora in many different locations. And that's quite important for us here in London. I that you did that. <laughs> so without ado, we will press on. So you know our topic is Ireland mm. Agents of Social Transformation. So my first question is really a bit of a bald one, which is, do you think, is it your view, that Ireland is in need of social and political transformation? <laughs> I think Ireland's in the middle of social and political transformation and I, whether, you, whether you answer the question yay or nay as to whether it needs it, I don't know how you would stop it, even if you wanted to. Um, and I think it's a good thing. I think social and political transformation is, um, well, going, taking, the, taking a cue from um, a, a man associated once with this college, and uh, Newman who's talked about you know to, to be human is to change and to be perfect is to change often and so I, I think that that process of change and of self-critiquing and of developing and growing is absolutely essential I can't think of a country in the world that couldn't be doing with it and uh, Ireland no more and no less than any other um, needs the dynamic it needs the momentum of social and political change um, social and political transformation I mean to to coin a new phrase, I suppose, you know, Hibernia Semper Transformanda, <laughs> to borrow from the, the one that's more generally used with the Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. The first is true, the second I'm not sure if it's true. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, Ireland is, I think Ireland's engaged in a process, a very, very, very profound process of social and political transformation. And it's a good, it's a good kind of transformation that is happening. Uh, because it is being generated by the fuel of it, essentially, I think, is um, uh, the, what, for, what we have now, which is a, um, a really two generations now of Irish people who've had access to, two, three generations, but certainly two generations who've had access to top quality um, uh, education and uh, third level education uh, widely available now, bu building on the availability of second level education. And I think the generational effect of that is really kicking in. And the other side of that is, of course, the realization, you talked about the diaspora at the beginning, um, the realization that, you know, that Irish culture and Irish sociological and political change is not just generated from within Ireland, but that the links with the uh, global Irish family are so strong and so formidable that, that there's this fluency, the, 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 the wells that, the, that we draw from for social and political transformation, and not to mention cultural transformation, are very, they're very deep and they're very widely distributed, I think. And that's very healthy. I suppose in using the term transformation rather than social change, the, um, the idea behind it was that uh, you're really referring to the sort of radical end of social change. So fundamental social, cultural, political, economic mm -hmm transformation. So, and you're saying Ireland's going through a really a significant process at the moment. So what would you cite as major examples of that? Obviously globally everybody was uh, aware in May of the same-sex mm. marriage referendum which was in a way almost, um, <laughs> almost a better um, advert for Ireland than almost anything that's happened in the last five years. So I wondered what else you would really single out as well, the fundamental processes going on. Well, I think that um, there, that's an obvious one, and but it, and it would be wrong to um, to downplay it. I mean, it is extraordinarily significant that two out of three voters, mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind what the if you like the cultural identity and the religious identity of those voters, most of them will have been. Uh, would have come from a, from a uh, Christian church background, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, but mostly Catholic. Most of them will have been paedo-baptised Catholics. They'll have been baptised as infants into the Catholic church. Most of them will have gone through Catholic school, um, uh, right the way through Catholic school, from age you know, four or five through to 18. 
they will have been the products of a church that has a very strong view on that particular subject and, um, and a church which demands from its members obedience to the magisterium of the church and the teaching magisterium of the church, obedience to sacred pastors and, and their teaching. And so for that audience and that voting audience to vote as they did um, is indicative of a very, very profound, um, a very profound transformation in relationships and in attitudes. And that didn't happen overnight. I mean, I got involved in uh, gay rights campaigning back in uh, the uh, mid-1970s. And I was a founder member of what was then called the Campaign for Homosexual Law Reform, founder member of the Hirschfeld Centre, which was the first of its type, uh, a, a centre for gay people um, to, meet, to, to meet openly, uh, to begin the process of um, being a regular, everyday, open and out part of Irish society, included and not excluded, and to do that with the backing of uh, those of us who were involved in the setting up of the Hirschfeld Centre and the campaign. We were drawn from all walks of life, but most of us were people who um, were involved in some way or another in human rights and civil rights campaigning. So it was, a, it was a, nowadays it would be called a gay straight alliance, I suppose. Um, but that's what it was, and very, very effective it was. But 40 years ago, we set out down, you know, the, the road was a blank sheet of paper, frankly. And I remember, I remember, I can't remember the exact date, but probably it was around 1979, 80, um, possibly 1979, because I was still in, I was in Trinity College at the time, and um, as a, uh, working as a lecturer, and we, the campaign for homosexual law reform was in the early stages of building up um, its energy and its profile. And I remember on a radio programme actually suggesting that, that one of the things that, that would be a natural corollary of the development, the understanding of the, the, the rights and the equal rights, and the right to equal dignity of our gay citizens would be gay marriage. And, you know, nobody jumped up and down then. Maybe they thought the idea was so outlandish that it wasn't even worth mentioning <coughs> to me. But actually, it, to be honest, then nobody jumped up and down with indignation. Um, or at least not publicly, they may have done so in their homes um, or palaces or whatever, but nobody actually did. <laughs> and um, what struck me afterwards was um, a number of years later, in 1984, the um, um, Archbishop Dermot, R then Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Ryan, um, uh, you might remember that was the era of the, um, of the Ireland had sat down to, we had, the, we had the New Ireland Forum, Ireland had sat down to think and reflect on its future and how it shaped that future, but the, essentially the political future might have, might be. And uh, Archbishop Ryan um, asked me to um, go as a member of the Roman Catholic delegation to the New Ireland Forum. Now, just shortly before that, they had submitted um, a, a written document. To the, you, could, you could make a number of submissions. You could submit in writing. You could submit in oral testimony. But they had submitted um, an absolutely god-awful document <laughs> that was largely, I understand, written by the then Bishop Jeremiah Newman of Limerick. And it was just awful. It was tro atrocious. And I think everybody more or less agreed that it was. And uh, it was an embarrassing document. And so I was then, then they had decided that, that they wouldn't rely on the written document. They would now make a, an oral presentation. And I was asked to be one of two lay people who were part of the team, I think of six of us, who were, uh, who were um, to make the oral presentation. And I said, first of all, that I wouldn't do it unless it was understood that the written presentation was completely off the agenda. It no longer counted. It would be... Um, superseded by the oral transformation or the oral presentation, that wasn't a problem. But I said to I said to Archbishop Brian, why are you asking me? I mean, you you do know. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a member of the uh, founder member of the campaign for gay rights, and um, this is a live forum, and we can be asked any question. And I'm not going to, if I'm asked a question about gay rights, I'm not going to take what I might call the church view. Um, I, I couldn't do that. And he just looked at me and he said, did I ask you to? <laughs> and I said, no, in fact, you didn't. And he said, well, I'm not doing it. I'm not asking you to surrender your views. And I, that was then, that was in 84. Um, I, I wondered subsequently, could that have happened in later years? I'm not sure, but that was then. 
And so the process of transformation around the issue of gay rights, I mean, I was talking to Gay Byrne uh, two days ago, I ran into him uh, walking the streets of Dublin, and um, we were talking about it, and he was saying, gosh, do you remember when the, when the question arose then, the campaign was very successful and in, it, went to the European, it went to the European Court and the European Court ruled that the laws on, in relation to um, the criminalisation of homosexual acts were unlawful were un, and sh uh, were um, a breach of uh, the human rights and the human dignity of our citizens, so the law had to be changed. And Gay was reminding me, and I think he's been one of the extraordinary um, engines of that, that program, the Late Late Show, was one of the great engines of social transformation uh, because it allowed you to discuss issues in what was actually a very, very safe environment. You could test waters in that really very safe environment. He was the safest pair of hands for all sorts of issues. But the, on the night that that was discussed, people got up and left this, walked out of the studio, you know, shouting and roaring back at him. So, uh, so, th so minds had to be changed, and there had to be process of persuasion. And I think that so th that uh, that's been going on really for a period of forty years. Mm -hmm. And so, by the time we get to by the time we get to May twenty second, there has you know there have been several generations of thinking around this issue, and that in turn has you know. A the issue has fed a, a whole process of transformation of Irish life and Irish discourse. And so that, that's, that's one major example of the transformative effects. I also think, frankly, that looking at, the, looking at our attitude to our relationship with Britain is another classic example of transforming uh, and transformed relationships. I, I went into office in 1997 uh, as president. That was prior to the Good Friday Agreement and to be honest with not a great prospect that we might even get a Good Friday Agreement because then the fragments that, you know, the fragments that, that were at the, and there were very sharp, you know, the broken glass that was Northern Irish politics and was also Irish politics and Irish British politics. It was very, very hard to pull those sharp fragments together and to see how they could be pulled together. Even when I came into office, things were still very difficult. And yet by 1998, um, with um, remarkable uh, political acumen and pushing and shoving, and also the, the, the will of the people, uh, the desire of the people for peace, that managed to create and generate the, the momentum that became the Good Friday Agreement with help, of course, from uh, our friends in the United States, um, this and our diaspora playing their role there. So that, but that was, a, that was the start of um, the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement and the hopes that were expressed there. They required of people that the gravitational pull of history you know, which always brings you back to baggage and a kind of a torpor of the past and that awful sense of, you know, the, 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 the old ways of looking at each other, the old ways of dealing with each other, the old language of engagement that had always been so bitter and conflict-ridden. Sooner or later, we, we, we had to strip all, if the pr peace process was to be successful, we had to strip that away. And I'm not just talking about su successful in terms of a successful government in Northern Ireland. I'm talking about the relationships between Ireland and Britain, within Ireland, cross-border, uh, within Northern Ireland. All of those had to just be engaged in a constant process of literally transforming the old attitudes. And I think that you know there, there's evidence that it's <laughs> certainly we haven't reached a human state of perfection, God knows, um, or f and we're a long way off it, but we're an awful lot better than we were. And when I came into office in 97, one of the things that I thought sh we hoped would be on the agenda, for example, would be that times would have, would have moved on far enough that we could have had um, Her Majesty the Queen come on um, uh, the first aid visit um, to uh, the Republic. And that seemed like, for a very long time, that seemed like um, an ask too far. But by 2011, it became possible and happened, and of its nature, I thought, was transformative. Um, there were, you can imagine around it, there were a lot of worries, a lot of concerns, a lot of security concerns, and a lot of opposition, a lot of genuine reasons for you know, worrying about having such a thing. Was it too soon? Was it, uh, was it too late? Um, <laughs> all of that. Um, and then, then it happened, and we had four 
remarkable days, I think, which were summarised for me, um, if uh, tr tr uh, talking about how, how, how extraordinary those days were and how impactful they were on individual human beings and their thinking. I had a huge, huge post after it, as indeed had Her Majesty the Queen, and one of the letters I got uh, was from an elderly lady. It didn't start off terribly well. I thought I was going to get you know, reprimanded. It said, I'm a 90-year-old Republican, and I have no time for monarchs. And in particular, I have no time for the monarch next door. And I thought, oh, God, this is not going well now. And this, was, this arrived the Monday after the Queen had left. And, and then she said, but... In deference to you as president, I decided I would watch the first five minutes of her arrival on television. <laughs> so she said, I watched the first five minutes and four days later, she said the television nearly spontaneously combusted because she hadn't turned it off. She was so captivated by what happened and she said she cried for four days. And in the crying, she said she felt so much melt away so many things that needed to melt, melted away. And then her final line was that when the Queen left, she said she reflected back on the days and she felt that they had been choreographed by the angels. <laughs> and I thought that was a rather nice, really rather nice expression. And if somebody was to summarise those four days for me, I could live with that as a summary. Uh, it was not choreographed by angels, incidentally. <laughs> if she had only known, right, Francis? Not choreographed by angels. Let me put that on the record. But, um, uh, but the people who choreographed it choreographed something that released, um, you know, for me, um, a grace into, the, into relationships, a grace into individual thinking, into collective thinking. And in fact, I experienced that same sense of a grace flooding, flooding, Irish life on May 23rd when the results came in um, and the transformative effect of that was extraordinary. Actually I had a very personal transformative experience because my mother who thankfully lives in Northern Ireland didn't have a vote um, <laughs> um, had told me that well you know if she had a vote she wouldn't know what way to vote and I said well don't tell your grandson that um, her gay grandson I said I wouldn't be saying that to him now if I was you and um, anyway, I said, well, thanks be to God, you haven't got to vote anyway. <laughs> so that's one less that we have to worry about. But interestingly, on the morning of, on the, morning of, the, um, of tr the 23rd, the day after the vote, as the results were coming in, but before they were fully known, though, the, the trends were clear by about lunchtime. And I got a phone call from her. She never phones me. I always phone her. She, I, but anyway, she phoned me. And um, her, she said, isn't it wonderful, she said, the news, um, are, we are winning. <laughs> and I just said, what, what news bulletin are we dealing with now and, and who is we? And and because at this stage I was thinking, God, have I missed a news bulletin? Has it gone the wrong way now? <laughs> and and she said, No, no, no. She said the yes side is winning. And I said, I thought you were on the no side. And no, she said, I decided that if I had a vote, I'd vote yes. And I said, When did you decide that? This morning, she said. <laughs> so uh, so, and there was that was pretty transformative, you know, for an eighty-four-year-old woman with very fixed views and a daily mass score, pretty good. Um, so. So look, um, about at an individual level and at a, at a collective level, there are, you know, there, uh, these are not straws in the wind. These are not straws in the wind. These are evidence of, of very, very, um, uh, of a lot of discourse, a lot of thinking, a lot of talking. Um, the, the, you can imagine what we've been through in the last number of years with the, the austerity. Uh, program and what that has done to people's thinking and talking about the kind of world they want to inhabit, the kind of values it has. You can, can imagine I, at the can moment. I just ask yeah, you on that. Yeah. Have you been a bit um, in any way surprised at the um, uh, what is usually commented on until the issue of water came up last year? But what has been commented on is the relative lack of public protests in the aftermath of the crash of the Celtic Tiger, the um, bailing out of Anglo-Irish, the uh, loading of public mm. debt on the Irish taxpayer, the taxpayer. 
and uh, you know, and all the after the analysis of the Celtic tide uh, that have come out showing how what wealth was generated went into tax cuts rather than into the health system mm -hmm. or the um, education system. So I'm wondering, given all of that, and given that Ireland is, uh, you know, reckoned to be almost the most, apart from Greece, the most indebted country in Europe, whatever tales of good news are being told at the moment, the debt is going to be paid off for many years, going to have to be paid off for many years ahead. I was wondering, given, you know, what you've just described are deeply transformative mm. processes, and you're commenting on hearts and minds, really, but I wondered in that context how you would see the relative lack of public protests until that those protests over water. Well, I wonder what you know how you character how do you characterise public protest? I mean, if you were a member of a Fianna Fáil government, you would have thought that there was a fairly significant protest yeah. when you were summarily dismissed, and the party that had been the biggest party in Ireland was left with one single TD in the biggest constituency, which is Dublin. So I, th I, th I thought that was a very significant protest yeah. um, and a very significant statement of the people, the state of mind. So it, it depends what you mean by protest, doesn't it? And um, if you mean by street protest, um, the different matter. I think the Irish are uh, an extra. Well, first of all, they're very clever and a very pragmatic people. Very, very, very pragmatic people. Um, also, possibly, um, though I'm probably going to sound like I'm contradicting myself now. When I go back to the referendum most recently, they're an obedient people in that sense. I mean, we have a, a culture of um, of getting on with it, um, of stoical acceptance. Um, it's almost a spiritual thing, isn't it? Um, and um, just getting on with it. But I, I don't really buy the argument that says that there, it was a no protest time. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of anger expressed, righteous anger, and that the politicians um, who, uh, and the banks for that matter, but particularly the politicians, um, since we don't vote for the banks, um, uh, regrettably, um, mm -hmm because that might have told a tale also, um, but the, um, but the, and because we need the banks in a way, um, also regrettably. Um, but in, in, when people got the opportunity to express what, what was going on in their hearts and minds, they did it very emphatically, very emphatically indeed, but through the political process. And so I, I, you know, I, I, I just don't buy the argument that there was no protest. But wasn't it a protest where the party held responsible was rejected, but what was voted in was a, a, a government that then continued the same policies broadly in terms of uh, going along with the arrangements. You know, they, they went into that election in 2010 saying they wouldn't do what the um, EU was demanding, but in effect they actually did and did a different sort of deal. So it's a sort of protest, I totally agree with you, but I'm wondering how deep-rooted that is, and how, and I, I suppose I'm more drawn to your argument about, you know, a, a sort of stoicism. No, I think that there is, I think there is a cultural stoicism, there is, a, and, and a cultural pragmatism as well, uh, okay, let, let's get on with it. Um, by the time the new government came in, um, we were um, wedded to, essentially, to the, um, to the Troika, and to um, what they, um, their, the stall that they had set out for the future, and it had, a, it, in fairness to it, at least it had a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. And I think people's attitude was, you know, let's just let's just trundle through this, push through. It really was a push through time, and uh, I'm not sure that for a lot of people that it still isn't a push through time. And maybe the water, the reaction to the water charges are are an example of um, of break point mm -hmm. for people that there is a break point for some people, and um, many people met it then. We, I would have a different view to it, coming as I do from living as I do in County Roscommon, where we have been on a boil water notice for seven years, and we have every single drop of water we have made tea with and coffee with, um, or washed our vegetables in for the last seven years has had to come from the local supermarket. So um, I would take a slightly different view. Um, but that is not to say that those who are who lost their jobs, those who were living in ne negative equity, those who were feeling, um, who were the victims really of um, the, 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 the most of the austerity measures, uh, just put their hands up and said, thus far and no further. 
it became a lightning rod for, for in other words, there, there was protest in people's hearts. There was pragmatism, there was stoicism, but there were limits to all of those. Mm. And they're expressed in different ways. Mm. Changing the subject somewhat, um, I wondered, uh, I thought we'd move on to the Catholic Church. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> if you have to. <laughs> oh, go on then. Well, we are at St Mary's. Um, so, uh, you may not agree with this, but... I was reading something about uh, a writer, Paul Blanchard, who in the 1950s described Ireland as the nearest a Western democracy can get to being a theocratic state. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about that time, obviously, the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's been, this would be another place, an lo um, institutional location in Ireland, where there has indeed been a lot of transformation uh, some from within, but a lot from without, with in many different directions. And I wondered whether you you could see the Catholic Church in Ireland. You know, ever, do you see? Unless we had a complete, if unless there was a completely different constitution, um, you know, without that formalising almost of an alliance between the state and the church in Ireland, which is obviously what he Blanchard was referring to. I wonder whether you can ever see the Catholic Church in Ireland, I meant across it as an institution, not the individual parishes or priests, who I know all sorts of good examples about, but I meant as an institution, ever playing a role positively in bringing about political change in particular, but other social change as an institution going forward. Because obviously it's played that role in other countries in quite a number of other countries, in fact, where the Catholic Church has been the church that has aided people in trying to change the society in which they're living. But do you think the history of the church means that, in Ireland, that means that isn't likely role for the institution? Although you will get, of course, um, you know, I think of people like Sister Stan, who runs the Immigrant mm, Focus Centre and mm. initiated it mm. in uh, Dublin who's a, you know, a tribute to that aspect of Catholicity. So uh, I'm just wondering in your views of it going forward. Yeah, I first of all want to redefine or maybe take issue with the definition of what is meant by the church and who you characterise as the church. Some people characterise the church as the hierarchy. Um, and if you're just talking about them, that's um, a different ballgame from talking about what I would call the people of God. People like Stan, the people in, in parishes, the people who do the work, the people who are the hands of amazing work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very conscious of the fact. Um, I'm sitting here as a former president of Ireland. I had an education. I got to university. I got to decent schools. My husband went to the Christian Brothers. Um, one of them, um, a graduate of, uh, of this, um, of this uh, university. Um, and a cousin of Jim's, as well as a cousin of mine, uh, Brother uh, McGreevy. Um, men like this and women who, the Dominican nuns, the Mercy nuns who taught me, they gave just the single most phenomenal uplift to my generation. When the advent of free education um, arrived in Northern Ireland just a few years later than here in, um, in, uh, uh, in England, um, towards the end of the 1940s, the opportunity was there to, if you like, to gear up you know, to, to really now use um, uh, education as a tool, particularly in Northern Ireland, for the uplifting of a community that felt very oppressed and very, out, very, very left out. My father, who had come as a young man 14 years of age from the west of Ireland um, to work in Belfast, um, as indeed had Jim's mommy, um, my grandmother's sister, um, uh, they had come... Um, his, his view as a young man with a young family was, we grab hold of this. This is a, an opportunity we can't miss. And, but, but now you needed teachers, and now you needed schools, and you needed to scale them all up. And the people who scaled them up were that generation who sacrificed their lives for, for my generation. These were um, uh, the nuns and priests of that generation. And I would say without fear of contradiction, yes, for many, many people experience the dark side, and we know of that you know, from the Ryan report and from the Murphy reports, we know the dark side of it. There was also a light side of it, and the light side of it was people like us who went through, who didn't have 
problems and who really just benefited, who were the beneficiaries of that system. And we were also beneficiaries of a system that I dislike intensely, which is the 11 plus system. Um, I dislike that so intensely. I just, I, I hate the, 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 the idea of consigning three quarters of your children, you know, to some kind of a sense of failure. I hate that. But, but actually we were the, uh, Martin, pa I, I passed the thing, Martin didn't. And, uh, but his mummy dragged him down to the Christian brothers and, and said to them, you know, make something of this fella. Um, <laughs> and they took lucky the mother, <laughs> <laughs> lucky for me, as he says. And um, so, you know, th so for me, uh, when we talk about the church, um, I'm very anxious just to say that, uh, you know, I think that there, uh, if we're talking about hierarchies and, and church um, structures um, that are about governance, uh, and about control. Um, uh, my experience of church is also, and, and I've experienced that, and uh, uh, sometimes very unhappily, um, but what I've, what I've really experienced has been the people of God at work. Uh, and, and I actually see it at the moment in the refugee crisis, um, where the people have listened to leaders um, and have said, actually, do you know, do you see when you start talking about numbers, we just really want to talk about people. We want to talk about people who are in crisis. We want to talk about people who are in need. And that's where my heart lies. I mean, I remember in 1969, a civil war broke out in my doorstep in Ardoin. My father packing his children into a car with the clothes that we stood up in and fleeing in fear. And believe you me, the thing that taught me, because we arrived in Dublin the early hours of the morning with a, we had a sniper on the roof of a school next door to us, uh, we had um, all sorts of uh, disasters opening up on our doorstep and fears of the future and not knowing what was lying ahead. And one of the things I learned from that experience is you are on your own. And that is how these people who are the migrants and uh, the refugees and not a migrant crisis, but the refugee crisis, that is how they are in reality. They have picked up and left their homes petrified and hoping against hope that this awful reality of being on your own, that somewhere out there, there is a people, whether they're a people of God or a people of values, who will respond to their need, human being to human being, and reach out a helping hand and offer it. And they won't have to die on beaches in order to achieve it and uh, that that will be there spontaneously. And I've seen that occur right throughout Europe. I've seen it happen in Ireland, I've seen it happen here in Britain, I've seen it happen elsewhere in Europe, where the ordinary man, woman and child on the street has said, actually, do you know what? We have to do something, you know, we can't, we can't just respond by talking about numbers or bureaucracies or structures. Um, we have to talk about this as, human being to human being, human need um, to um, the, the needs of human beings. If we have any wherewithal at all, no matter how meager, can we, can we consolidate and offer it? And um, so my, I, uh, uh, that, that experience of being without a home, we eventually lost that home through the troubles, um, that experience of being literally a refugee uh, on my own island, and knowing, I went to the St. Vincent de Paul organisation, for example, that I had been a member of uh, since I was 15. And I went there, I went to the head office in Dublin, I went to the head honchos and I asked for help. And you know, they patted me on the head and told me I was a good wee girl and um, did nothing. Um, I, um, and I remember just the awful sense of aloneness, uh, the overwhelming sense of being on your own and hoping that there was a heart out there somewhere that was capable of softening enough to help. Um, and that was, uh, that was a lot of work. That was a lot of work. I've just got two more questions before we open it to the um, floor for questions. Um, the first one is really just to ask your view about an issue um, in relation to the diaspora. And um, I'm going to read here, I extrapolated, I don't know it off by heart, but I, this morning off my phone I extrapolated one sentence from the 1916 proclamation where it says, the Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens. 
Now that particular sentence is being used now to some extent uh, in the campaigns to get the vote for Irish citizens abroad. And when one sort of views Ireland from the diaspora, yourself, Mary Robinson, the current president, Michael D. Higgins, have all of you, uh, in your different ways, uh, made the diaspora quite at the heart of who you saw your remit as relating to. And you've all done that in your own particular way. And uh, for example, I was at the Global Irish Civic Forum in um, Dublin in early June, the first week of June, and without doubt, the best speech that was given over the two days was the speech that Michael D. Higgins gave on immigration because he conveyed he really understood it, and uh, which one didn't uh, uniformly get from the various ministers, etc., who were there. So I, um, I, what I'm really asking you is that um, there is a certain sense that the presidency, uh, particularly since 1990, has really embraced and understands multiple identities and understands you can be very settled and identified in one place but have a terrific allegiance or direct close connection to another place. Whereas the Irish state in many ways is very contradictory about its diaspora. On the one hand there's a big emigrant support programme, there's uh, the use of the diaspora in the Global Irish Economic Forum to, uh, as our current ambassador in London says, to really promote Brand Ireland. And then on the other hand, you get the fact that people, as soon as they leave Ireland, unless they travel back in the first 18 months, as many did for the mm. referendum in May, or, and maybe some who had been away more than 18 months, uh, you know, you get the sense that people, the young people who've left in the last five years, mostly in their 20s, not in their teens, like in previous phases, mostly 70% uh, graduates, mostly going in, especially in Britain and Australia, going into jobs. And it comes as a complete shock that they're disenfranchised from Ireland. And there's also all the obstacles... Well, apart from those who have the Senate vote, the yes, graduates yeah, who yeah, have yeah, the yeah, Senate vote. Yeah, but yeah. as long as, yes, indeed. But they don't view that in the same way as they would if they had the vote for the Doyle. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. So, because that is where power lies. So I suppose what I'm saying is that, in a way, all citizens aren't equal. You actually have, not that it says it anywhere in the Constitution, but you have to be resident to access all citizenship rights. And I just wondered what you thought about that, because there is no doubt that the marriage a same-sex marriage referendum was quite a significant turning point in focusing, because many people who would have liked to didn't get back it was too far, it was too expensive, they couldn't get away from work. But they were, you know, on Twitter and elsewhere, they were egging on those who did return. Mm -hmm. But you see, it's, it's not an issue that's ignored in Ireland. I mean, I'm not I think it, it's ignored. Yeah, I think it would be wrong to suggest that it's an issue that is ignored or is off the agenda. You might remember the, um, the, this, the, the group that was set up by the current government. Um, uh, 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 they had this um, constitutional forum. Yeah. And that was actually one of the issues that came up, and um, there were a number of recommendations that came out of that. So it is, it's an issue that is debated. It's, I would call that a live issue. And one of the things that's important about that live issue is to listen to the voices of the people who are the Global Irish family and to create the conduits for those voices. That particular constitutional forum, um, or the con bigger part of the con constitutional convention, um, was, one, was one such forum. Interestingly, the referendum created another one, um, and it, a lot of it was done on social media, where people created their okay. own fora for getting their voices heard. So I would regard this as, I think this is a very much a live issue that is likely to develop and grow legs and grow shape uh, in the future. I don't think that it's a, I don't think that where we're at now is, if you like, the done deal forevermore, but it's very much a live issue as to um, how that, how that, that desire of those who are citizens of Ireland living outside of Ireland want to be and need to be and feel they should be um, represented and have their voice heard. I think that's that the shape of that is, is as, even as we're talking, that it is being shaped. Well, it's a live issue. I, I, thi I think that's hopeful that you think that because that probably means other people think that. Uh, I mean, the Constitutional Convention was only actually allowed to address votes for the presidency. Correct. But 
that was welcomed massively because mm -hmm. I think uh, that would be very welcome. And but for example, members of the Department of Foreign Affairs have said to me, "In your dreams, vote for the uh, vote for the Doyle for Irish citizens abroad." You know, just in your dreams. Now that could have been the individual officials view but it, it it sort of just um except that is it i mean i wonder i mean i'm 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 born and reared in belfast um I came became president of ireland in 1997 i don't have i don't have a vote in the northern ireland assembly um and nor do i have a vote in westminster elections uh, so this is not i mean these these um things like that detail of um of voting rights is pretty much an issue right around the world um and indeed closer to home so uh, I think the beginning of that debate with the presidential uh, the, the issue of the presidential election was um, I think that was a, it was a good opening debate and it's the kind of thing that um, frankly you know as I look at where the debate is at currently um, and looking at the referendum in particular referenda are um, constitutional referenda um, are a very uh, the, the last one was a very a very very kind of important pulse of Irish thinking at home and abroad, mm -hmm. and so there are arguments there about if you're going to change something or transform something as fundamental as the Irish Constitution, the, the doll is about everyday life of the lived citizens who are living in the country. So I can I can kind of understand the arguments around around um, uh, if you're putting a wall around who votes. Uh, for the, for those who are going to make day to day policy and who's going to pay the taxes, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, that are going to be distributed by that government and distributed uh, mainly for the benefit of the people who are citizens, but including including our global Irish family, who pays, you know, the piper who pays and who calls the tune. There is probably an argument there, but in relation to big, you know, the the presidency in relation to referenda, um, you know, I can see th I can see those debates continuing to be really very important live debates that we will have um, you know just the, the the input from the diaspora the toing and froing I mean you, you mentioned there uh, the anecdote about somebody who you know a, a department official who says in your dreams well they aren't the holders and the keepers of no, the keys no. of the gate it's the people who are the holders and keepers of the keys of the gate and for as long as the debate for as long as the debate is had, for the long as the, for as long as the debate is facilitated, and that it grows and grows legs, and people put the pressure on, create the lobby groups, create the as they did uh, around the referendum on on gay rights, then the issue doesn't go away, and the issue stays live, and things happen, and things change. So, um, I must say, I, I I take great comfort from the huge interest, the ma just massive interest in the referendum on May 22nd, right around the global Irish family. But I, mean, I have Irish family, I've, I have relatives living in America, they are, they've been now second generation Irish, they weren't looking to have a vote, but they were fiercely interested. Um, on the other hand, kids, friends of my, of my kids um, who are in Australia and who are in New Zealand um, and who couldn't afford to come home were really rattled, really rattled that they couldn't uh, because these are people who intend coming back. These are young people who decided to go off for two or three years to, you know, to um, to ride out the recession, and they were narked that it was too far for them to come home. That there was no, that there was no way of um, of you know of remote voting uh, through embassies or whatever. So uh, I, th I think listening to those voices is a really very healthy thing. Uh, it can't do us any harm at all to listen. Well, I'll move on, because those who know me well here know on this issue I could go on forever. Mm -hmm. But I must let you know that uh, it's been de debated in Westminster Parliament <coughs> before Christmas, and y you'll have David Cameron to thank, because he's thinking of removing the restri year restrictions so every British citizen who's abroad will be able to vote indefinitely for mm -hmm. the Westminster Parliament, and that's been urged on him by the EU as they've also urged Ireland to change. Well, that's an example of the debate changing yeah. and moving, you know, and people inputting. And that's, that's, that's how change happens. He, change doesn't happen if you stay silent. No. Simple as that. Uh, well, my very last question is, you were president of Ireland for 14 years, uh, more than your predecessor. And we, we gather Michael D. Higgins won't be um, standing for a second term. 
So I just wondered, from that unique vantage point in recent history, what you felt you learned about the limitations, but also the possibilities of the role. I think the possibilities of the role were always what attracted me more than the limitations. I mean, people talk about the limitations. You, you can't say this and you can't say that and you can't speak out on this public issue and that public issue. And my attitude to that was, well, if I wanted to speak out on those, I'd have run for the doll or I'd have joined a lobby group. You know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I had read the Constitution. I know what the presidency does. I know what it can say and what it can't say. That's the job I applied for. There was no point in whinging once you got the job that the job description doesn't fit what you wanted to do. So, um, so I was perfectly happy. And in particular, um, in particular, given the 1997 coming out of Northern Ireland. Um, uh, having a, a very good understanding of the politics of the Republic, having lived there and having been involved to some extent in politics, um, having also lived um, and been born and raised in Northern Ireland, I, and, and having taken this theme of bridge building as the, if you like, the, the, dis, the dis, sort of the distilled focus, um, the, 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 the strap line that would distill the focus of the presidency. Um, I could see, if you like, the moral pastoral space that is occupied by the presidency as being particularly suited to what I wanted to do with it, mm. and particularly suited to the moment we were in, uh, where building of relationships between um, the people who inhabited the island, north and south, uh, the, between the two communities in Northern Ireland and between Ireland and Britain, that was absolutely essential. If we were to stop that, you know, not just the gravitational pull of history from continuing to constantly get in the way of building a much more liberated and much more liberating future. Um, so the language had to change um, and that's what leaders are about. Leaders are about trying to go to a place that people haven't gone to before, you know, moving out into that, you know, into the deep and showing that you can still walk on water. Uh, you know, and not drown. That's what you're supposed to do. And so I love that. I have to say, I love that pastoral, I would call it a pastoral or moral space, um, where um, I was very sure footed, um, or at least I was very sure rather about um, what, we, what we wanted to accomplish in the North and what it would take to do that. And how you'd have to make, um, we just have to make tracks that weren't made before. We'd have to create relationships that weren't created before. We'd have to take chances that weren't taken before. Um, Martin, as you know, my husband gave up his job and gave up his career um, to sit unpaid in Aris and on for 14 years on the phone, talking to people, uh, persuading them, trying to persuade them to come to dinner, tea, lunch as I ate for Ireland. Um, so, <laughs> uh, trying still to recover from that phenomenon. Um, and um, so, to try and talk to people whom we knew we had to engage with on the basis that we weren't trying, because we both come out of evangelical traditions now, you know, we have the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation still being played out, and we both come out of these strong evangelical traditions that thinks nothing, in fact, thinks only of persuading the other to transform in the sense of conversion. And we had, to get up, we had to get beyond that. You know, we just had to move away from that evangelical conversion tradition to starting with how do you build up communities that are sensible, sane, happy, and non-violent? People, you, it's a, you, you create good neighbors. Neighbors who are prepared to live with each other, work with each other, who aren't too bothered about each other's points of view or perspectives or politics or religion, but just get on with the job of living together in some degree of harmony. And we didn't have that in Northern Ireland. I knew that because I'd lived there. I knew that we could live cheek by jowl. I lived in Protestant neighbourhoods all my life, uh, except for after we lost our home, and um, for a very short time lived in Anderson's town. And all of my life growing up, I had known you can live cheek by jowl with people. I mean actually right next door. You can be bridesmaids for each other's kids. You can go on holidays together, and you can live in the most terminal ignorance of each other. And in the case of a conflict society like Northern Ireland, that, that ignorance is dangerous because it is filled with not an acknowledgement that you live in ignorance of each other, but the very opposite. 
a, a belief that you know each other intimately, so intimately that you can be contemptuous of the other and their views. And that is a dangerous and ultimately self-defeating thing when that person is always going to be your neighbour. I had kind of figured out, Martin's a mathematician around here, I'm the lawyer, I'm not brilliant on maths, but at least I had figured out that in Northern Ireland, and indeed on the island of Ireland, and between these islands, we were always going to be neighbours. We'd always been neighbours, we were always going to be neighbours. We weren't going anywhere, they weren't going anywhere. We might wish that we would go places other places, but it wasn't going to happen. So the pragmatist in me said, you know what, we've really just got to start friendship building. And that is what we did. So we brought people and we started out with the onion layers, you know, with, with the first onion layer of people who would actually come um, and have the cup of tea with us and not think that they were supping with the devil. Or if they were thinking they were supping with the devil, at least were willing to sup with the devil. And, um, and then we, we, with, with that, one, that first layer, and, and thanks be to God, I'd grown up in a Protestant community, as had Martin, because those were the friends that we went to first. They were the people who penetrated with us the, the, the community from which we were most estranged, and that, uh, and that was our... Um, Protestant stroke, British stroke, Unionist community. And um, little by little, um, over a period, and it took 14 years, I think it took the full 14 years, to really um, be able to say that you could lift the phone literally and phone anybody and they would come. I mean, uh, we had, uh, the very big, w w people would say that you'd, you'd never get the Reverend Ian Paisley to come, but he did, when he and his wife came and they had breakfast with us. And, um, uh, and that was before he became, you know, um, converted to the peace process, um, completely converted to the peace process. And um, so uh, we'd, we'd, here's what we discovered during that, because it's something that I'd always believed. The human person is capable of change and they are capable of change for the better. They're also capable of change for the worse, but they're also capable of change for the better. And it's the change for the better that you hope in, you work for, you focus on. And that's, that's what we were able to do in the 14 years. And to build the relationships, to show people that we were only interested in friendship building, in good neighbourliness, and that the friendships were not for photo opportunities, because there's a lot of cynicism around politics and, you know, and photo ops. And so we didn't do that. Um, the people that we befriended over those years um, became friends. As I said to Martin, we left, you know, we left Aris and Ucturon with, a, with an uncanny number of ex-paramilitary friends, <laughs> and hopefully ex-paramilitary friends, and um, certainly paramilitary friends, and, um, and the ex uh, we hope in and pray for, uh, the continuation of that. And these were people who we know because we, you know, we did the work. Martin sat on the phone um, week after week, month after month, trying to get to persuade people to come just simply to have a cup of tea and talk. And we'd say to them, we're not going to talk politics. You know, we'll talk holidays, we'll talk kids, we'll talk about the future you want for your kids. Um, we're not going to, you know, we're not taking, we're not bringing you here, you know, to, to try and persuade you to a point of view that we, um, um, we think we want you to share. The only thing we want, hopefully, at the end of this, is that you go away with a view that there are people who just simply want to befriend and are quite happy to live in a country where people are friends with very, very different perspectives. And that's what we did for 14 years. And um, at the end of it, um, we saw, hu now, in the background, of course, to all that, the Good Friday Agreement and the work, the enormous work that was being done at the political level, the huge work that was being done at community level, was helping to feed all of that. But we felt that what we were doing too was a tributary also feeding that at the level, at a very important level, which was the level of the presidency. And that it helped to open hearts, it helped to lock, you know, it helped to unlock doors. Um, that mattered. That really mattered to us. And in my view, at the end of the 14 years, in the particularly in the experiences we had with the loyalist community, and we, bearing in mind that we both grew up, Martin particularly grew up in a very, you know, a, a very embedded uh, loyalist community in East Belfast, and I had grown up at the top of the Shankill Road, um, th we could see the softening of hearts. We had, we could, our ears were tuned to the raucous, raw, conflict-ridden, 
um, antagonistic language that was, that was very characteristic of Northern politics and North-South politics. And we listened while that language softened. We could hear it soften. And believe you me, soften, softened language opens, also opens hearts and opens possibilities and doors. The bitter word closes them. And we lived through a time when those, the, the bitterness just started to, it just, I won't say it's com certainly not completely gone, God knows, that's, that's the work of a hundred years. But the change in language, the change in temper, <coughs> Um, did open up possibilities, and I'm hoping that again it will do that. You know, now that the Northern Assembly has hit another, um, you know, another pothole in the road, and in my view, that's hopefully all that it is—that it's a pothole rather than a major obstacle. And God knows these are people who have overcome enormous obstacles. Uh, so this one should not be beyond the wit of the politicians also to, they should be able to fill in this pothole, I think, um, with goodwill. Um, and that's, that's what the peace process has given us. It's given, it literally has given us these years of peace with a peaceful future as a real possibility. But I keep reminding myself that we're only in the opening chapter. I mean, we have, I grew up in a place that was, <coughs> characterized by, you know, uh, reformation and counter-reformation politics, the politics of the 16th and 17th century. That's the bottom line. So, and we carried that as baggage and we carried all that language and all those attitudes and the stripping of that away, I think is the work of generations. I don't think it's the work just of, you know, of 17 or 18 years. I think it is the work of generations. But it's work that's ongoing. Um, on the other hand, you know, like going back to the gravitational pull. The gravitational pull of stupidity is really strong. There's that. You know, I'm very well aware of that. And the gravitational pull of how we've always done things and the gravitational pull of distrust. These are all, um, these are all things that we have to be really careful to understand that if we want to maintain the impetus, we want to maintain the momentum towards peace, that we really have to, we, we have to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to be constantly dragged back by those, you know, those, that, those torpid gravitational pulls that are always there and are always threatening and are always, you know, are always a comfortable place to rush back to um, when you lose faith for a moment or some incident or episode happens. But if you keep, your, if you keep focused on the bigger picture, which is the consolidation of peace, the creation of really sane and sensible and, and sane and sensible and decent relationships, both at the individual level and the political level, then it seems to me that, you know, that, che that, that, that the momentum that we have, the individual momentum and the collective momentum has to keep focused on the very, very big picture. And that's what we were able to do. That's what the, the role of presidency offered me, that being able to keep the vision of the big picture always there. <laughs>